Good morning and welcome to the November 16th Public Design Commission meeting. Uh, if you're watching via YouTube, uh, the, in the description below the video, you will find links to the agenda and uh, participation instructions and the public testimony sign-in form. And so if you would like to give testimony on one of the public hearing items today, you can join the meeting when it's called and then um, sign in and we'll go from there. Again, all of the instructions and the link to the agenda are in the description below the video. Okay, Signe. Uh, good morning. My name is Signe Nielsen, president of the Public Design Commission. The public meeting is now commencing. Uh, I'll begin with a roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. When I call your name, uh, please say here. Phil Ahrens. Here. Kenneth Amstead. Ken Seth here. Ken Seth, so sorry. Lori Hawkinson. Here. Deborah Martin. Here. Manuel Miranda. Here. Richard Moore. Here. Susan Morgenthau. Here. Ethel Sheffer. Here. Meryl Tisch. Here. Mary Valverde. Here. We have a full house, great. Uh, so we're now going to vote on the consent uh, agenda and we have items 27607 to item 27629. Um, staff has noted that there are no recusals, uh, but are perhaps there are uh, some new recusals. If so, please uh, indicate. Uh, it appears that there are no new recusals. So I will now call for a vote. Um, commissioners, when I call your name, uh, please state your vote for the consent agenda. You may approve or reject all, and you also may reject or abstain from individual projects. Bill Ahrens? Approve all. Ken Seth? Uh, approve all. Lori? Approve all. Deborah? Approve all. Manuel? Approve all. Richard Moore? Approve all. Susan? Approve all. Ethel? Approve all. Merrill? Approve all. Mary? Approve all. And myself approving all. Uh, so that would be a unanimous approval of the consent agenda. So now let's move on to the public hearing. Uh, per standard procedure, uh, the applicants will give their presentation. Then uh, if there is public testimony, we will hear that first. And then we will, as commissioners, uh, be able to ask questions, deliberate and vote. So the first on the agenda is item 27, uh, 27630, installation of a pilot modular comfort station at Luis Lopez Playground in uh, Staten Island. So I'm going to give control over to Jorgen, I believe, and then Jorge, are you giving an introduction? Okay. So Jorgen, you should have control. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Jorge Prado. I'm the deputy, I'm the director of architecture at uh, New York City Parks. Um, I want to thank the commission for hearing our uh, presentation this morning and for all the collaborative uh, work uh, that they've um, put into this project to date, starting with the RFP uh, a year ago uh, and down through, uh, through this uh, commission uh, presentation. Um, this is a very important project for parks. Um, this modular comfort station is serving as a pilot to help us uh, expand our toolkit to provide a comfort station uh, resources uh, to the community at large uh, across the city. Uh, it joins our standard comfort station uh, in that toolkit uh, as another uh, option available to us uh, to provide uh, services to the community. Um, I just wanted to um, thank uh, the commission again for all your collaboration with us and for your help in, uh, in directing our project. And now I would like to turn it over to Jurgen Rehm, uh, founding principal uh, at 1100 Architects, uh, design consultants who are developing the project on behalf of Parks. Thanks, Jurgen. Thank you, Jorge. Um, and thank you, commissioners, um, for collaborating with us on this um, pilot project for a modular conference station. 
Oh, I can't forward. Um, maybe try clicking on your mouse. If, if not, I can control it for you. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, in terms of the outset, uh, the goals for this particular uh, pilot project is to, uh, to have it be uh, a design and constructed as a modular uh, comfort station. Um, with that, uh, we would, uh, would like uh, to have uh, the construction duration be expedited and minimized, um, which uh, we believe could uh, potentially uh, provide cost savings uh, as well with an economy of scale. Design um, uh, is uh, targeted to be low maintenance and vandal proof and have a 50 year building uh, lifespan. And it should be used uh, year round um, and uh, shall be implemented and constructed in all boroughs. Uh, for this pilot uh, prototype, um, the construction is first uh, thought of to be at implemented at Louis Lopez uh, playground. And you, the uh, site is in the Park Hill neighborhood of Staten Island. Um, there are no uh, flood hazard um, on the site. There's an air, uh, the surrounding areas is primarily residential, uh, adjacent uh, is a school and some commercial use up in the north. As you can see, this is the current um, park um, as playground as it exists. Um, previously, uh, the site was uh, approved by the commission um, as an extension to the existing playground park. Here are some photographs of uh, already the clearing um, happening of the new site for the comfort station and some photographs of the surrounding. Uh, this is views uh, towards the residential neighbors. You're an overview of um, the overall site with the project side to the left. When we started the project, project uh, we evaluated different types of modular construction and uh, ended up uh, with a steel frame a modular construction type um, given the logistics of the implementation of these comfort stations throughout uh, so that uh, this is a lighter weight uh, modular system. It also uh, is a smaller in size overall. Um, and um, here's uh, already a preliminary study of how the modular units would be employed at the site, um, which is a survey done always prior to any kind of um, implementation of a modular system. Here the overview of the uh, floor plan of the modular system we developed. It's very much based on uh, the existing standard um, modular um, comfort, um, comfort station design, um, but here implemented and designed as a modular implementation. It also incorporates a, a green roof um, as part of the design and optimized daylight. Here's some elevations of the design, um, the front elevation with the three doors um, into the comfort station and uh, side view with the fenestration into the bathrooms. Likewise, the, another side elevation and rear which has a window into the center maintenance um, facility module um, with fresh air intake. Here, a rendered view of uh, the implementation at um, the playground uh, with the landscape design by, in conjunction with the de um, design department of parks. Another view from across the street from the residential area Here's a section um, of the comfort station, um, preliminary uh, or uh, geotech um, investigation um, uh, found that uh, pilot construction um, will be required for the foundation. 
You're an interior view um, showing the uh, maximization of natural light through both um, fenestration and skylights in the bathrooms. And here the uh, overall palette um, of the design uh, for the exterior um, was chosen uh, a two inch thick uh, glaze tile um, block um, as the, uh, the uh, exterior facade, a uh, highly durable material. The colorations are somewhat uh, derived and inspired by the colorations of the neighborhood uh, residential developments with hues of gray, white, and blues. The other material being implemented is stainless steel, uh, often used in comfort station. And the logo would be in um, a painted steel application uh, for lower maintenance. And otherwise, uh, other elements for the design, the green roof um, system Parks is implementing throughout uh, different facilities, a uh, dome skylight, stainless steel, uh, insulated glass units, um, and signage. Here an overall view of the landscaping um, surrounding the comfort station. And uh, the extension of the fence um, around the added site. Then some elements which you're probably accustomed to a standard uh, implementation of park standards, bench, fence, um, chain link fence, etc. And now likewise the uh, paving material and planting. We um, think that uh, other colors could be chosen for other sites, um, which would be again presented to the commission. Uh, we think that uh, the comfort station should be um, tailored to the site in particular so that uh, different variations can be implemented. You're also an investigation, uh, which we did a lot of studies on uh, in different sch schemes and options. This would be a, a solid color version. Um, and in this case, also in uh, hues of blues and whites. Okay. That's the last That's slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Well, first, let me ask Carrie, has anyone signed up to uh, give public testimony? No, we do not have anyone signed up. And uh, if you're watching YouTube now and you would like to give testimony on this, please sign in and join the meeting. And the public testimony sign in form link is just below the video. So on the basis of uh, not having anyone at the moment uh, uh, giving public testimony, I'll turn this over to commissioners for questions or comments. Well, um, I guess I can start if I'm unmuted. Am I, un I unmuted? Yeah, okay. So I just want to thank um, 1100 and Jurgen for their um, I'm gonna call it restrained optimism here in the design. I think that it's a really difficult challenge because you have so many constraints, <laughs> including this really tight budget. I know the other one, you know, was a million dollars more or something. So, um, you know, I think that bringing your strong design sense to this is, I mean, I greatly appreciate it. And um, I think also the, you know, I think the palette is interesting. I think that, you know, that given, I guess you're gonna have, there'll be options as you're showing within that so that those colors are selected. So it, I guess the trick is to how do you constrain that palette enough, but also leave it at this, you know, so that it doesn't get completely like, I don't know, into left field or also allow enough variation so that, you know, the kind of appropriate adjacencies can be considered. And I know I had made a remark about the green roof and I, I understand you don't, you can't really cut a tile at the top because it gets to be a slope or something. But um, 
maybe we can get really healthy sedum up there that'll perk above the roof line or something or cheat it up on yeah. some, I don't know. But I, I really, um, and then I, I really want to also say that maximizing the natural light is really important and I really appreciate that. I had a question about the, uh, the signage for the restrooms. Um, you know, I think for the men's and women's restroom, for the ADA signage, uh, I think according to research I've done, I'm not sure, I don't think you need the icon for the, to indicate the gender. Um, I mean, I would confirm that with, uh, you know, Department of Buildings, but I think if we don't need the icons for gender, I think, you know, men and women suffice. Um, I'm also curious where, um, you know, the statement about being able to choose your restroom based on how you self-identify your gender would be placed and what the language would be for that. And then in terms of, you know, a permutation with an all gender restroom, you know, I'd like to put forth that the term all gender instead of gender neutral is used. Yeah, uh, Manuel, are you... Uh, finished? Yes. Okay. Didn't want to cut you off. It's hard these days. Um, so I had a question. Uh, this is really directed to, um, I think, the Parks Department. Uh, in the instance where this um, comfort station might be used in a uh, vulnerable area from the standpoint of uh, flooding, <laughs> would there be any particular uh, redesign or would you just not use this comfort station in those situations? Uh, this is Jorge. I think, um, I think it's an excellent question. I think that uh, part of the reason for us to expand our toolkit is to address these uh, particular questions uh, more specifically. I think it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. As we know, in Seaside, we uh, elevated a standard comfort station um, and that project is moving ahead successfully and we're very happy with it. Uh, whether we would uh, contemplate putting a modular, I think that uh, I think that question is an open question, but it's something that we'll definitely um, need to address as uh, as this rolls out across the city. I, I don't see any reason why it would be precluded uh, out, out of power. Okay, uh, I did did want to thank um, eleven hundred for uh, coming up with uh, I think a, a very good solution, and uh, so congratulations. I didn't mean to bypass a compliment there. Thank you. <laughs> um, we did have one uh, staff comment, which was looking at the grout colors. I know this is very detailed, but something that we've seen in the other prototypical comfort stations is that the, the both the color specification of the grout, but also frankly, the installation of the grout has had some very uneven and sometimes not so nice results. And so that's something that will I want to continue working with you on uh, as we get the further detailed uh, uh, designs and specifications. Can I make uh, okay. just a, 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 a brief comment to, towards that? One of the benefits as well with the, uh, a modular system is that the uh, installation of grout or all the finishes are done within a factory. So quality control is much higher than uh, in the normal construction. Uh, so just something to point out. Great. Thank you, does, does anyone else have any questions or comments? I, you can raise your hand in the chat or, I mean, sorry, in the uh, participants list or just do this. No. And no one has signed up to testify. So I think we're ready to vote. Signe, she's she muted again. Unmute her. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> excellent. So in summary, I'd say that it was a very positive uh, reception to this and that really the only request is to uh, look at, at the signage uh, uh, language and uh, code issues. Um, but otherwise I think we are uh, feeling very positive. So we are going to uh, take a, a roll call vote on item 27630. So commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Um, you may approve, reject,
table or abstain. Uh, and if you feel like you'd like to make a final uh, summary comment uh, to contextualize your vote, please feel free to do so. Um, Phil. Approve. Ken said. I approve. Lori. Approved. Deborah. Approve. Manuel. Approve. Richard. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel. Approve. Meryl. Approved. Mary. Approved. And myself approve. Um, so let the record show that we have all in favor uh, and the project is approved. Um, excellent, thank you so much. Now we're gonna move on to the uh, next item, 27631, reconstruction of the Queens Storehouse Building in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. So Jorge, I'm gonna give you control. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the Queen Storehouse uh, in Flushing Meadow Corona Park uh, reconstruction um, is a very interesting project. Um, uh, the total current budget is fifteen and a half million dollars. Um, it is the main goals of the project are to uh, work on a lot of sort of technical things, uh, replace the roofing membrane, which requires replacement. There are a lot of water infiltration issues that need to be addressed. Um, work on the mechanical systems, uh, especially the drainage system uh, of the building uh, needs to be uh, brought back to a uh, good working order uh, to partially reconstruct some exterior uh, block walls, which were previously touched and, and left wanting, and we'll discuss that later. Uh, partial reconstruction of some concrete uh, slabs uh, in the building itself um, to add a new privacy screen around the covered yard, which we'll talk about more specifically later. Um, and to sort of expand the exterior yard by removing an, uh, an exterior uh, uh, asphalt ramp, which is serving two out-of-date uh, trash compactors, which are being removed, and to basically work on site drainage to prevent the flooding that's been occurring recently. If I can go down, it, it's located in Flushing Meadow, Corona Park, uh, across from the Aquatic Center. Uh, it is in a flood zone. Uh, it is the, uh, the original uh, iteration of this building was uh, the United States Postal Office a building for the uh, World's Fair um, uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, in day one. Um, an important thing to recognize here are the, um, the, the, the custom light fixtures, the Hamlet and Longer light fixtures that we will use as a design directive uh, going forward. This is what it looks like today uh, after a, a lot of neglect and uh, years of, of, of sort of back uh, office uh, use. Uh, as you can see, there are some drainage issues and some uh, damage to the west wall. Because of that, uh, the windows have been blocked up and these, uh, these uh, blocked uh, infills are causing some additional damage which needs to be addressed. Uh, all in all, the project will be phased to allow for uh, all of the uh, materials within the storehouse to be accessible during construction. So this is the phasing drawing that indicates the phase one, uh, phase two, and so on down the line. We can talk more specifically about that. Uh, this is the asphalt ramp uh, that's currently on the east side of the building between the building and the Van Lith Expressway. This ramp will be removed to create a little more space for uh, access. These are some interior views. Uh, this is the covered yard, uh, as it's called. This is the interior of the warehouse proper, uh, which has a lot of need for partial replacement of some of the, uh, the, the metal decking that composes the roof. Uh, this is the large roof membrane, which uh, obviously the drainage has failed. The membrane itself has failed in many areas and needs replacement. Uh, there are some serious cracks that run lengthwise on some of these uh, uh, slabs. Uh, those cracks have translated into uh, 45 degree angle cracks along the masonry, which we'll, we will address. Uh, this is the scope of work, again, to remove the asphalt uh, ramp, to open up the windows, but not uh, reinstate the glazing that would make it impossible to use as a storehouse, 
uh, we will take a, a different approach to it to remove a mass that was added later to the building, which is adding stress to the, to the structure. There are some fencing issues. Currently, there is a chain link fence that wraps around the trash compactors uh, and that wraps around the uh, enclosed yard, uh, as we're calling it. Uh, that will be removed and they will be replaced in closed yard with uh, a louver approach as we'll show in a moment uh, and there'll be a cleaner uh, fence along uh, the, uh, the access porch to that uh, to that working yard and we will extend the uh, timber uh, fence line that uh, delineates the difference between the parking lots beneath the Vanguard uh, Expressway and the actual uh, site itself. This is the site plan. Um, as you see it here, uh, the current uh, access is from uh, the north uh, through a, a roadway here where lots of semi tractor trailers and uh, packers and large vehicles uh, come in to uh, deliver materials here and also to go to the other Allied building, the Allied One building down uh, across the way. Um, and this is the floor plan of the existing facility. So this is uh, the photograph, historic photograph of the World's Fair building. This entrance here uh, is actually the covered yard, uh, as it's called now. It's essentially a canopy that uh, currently has chain link fencing around it. And that chain link fencing will be replaced with a, a louver fencing. These are the custom Hamel and Longer uh, light fixtures, which, um, excuse me. Uh, which uh, uh, were propagated across the World's Fair grounds throughout the Flushing Middle Community Park and now have been completely uh, removed. These are the original drawings from Hamel and Langer regarding their uh, choice of color palette uh, with some configurations uh, to be used here. So we have uh, drawn from their color palette a uh, series of colors and we have tried to match them with park standard colors as best we can to use on the louvered enclosure around what we're calling the covered yard, uh, the original entrance. The actual uh, infill, uh, instead of glazing, will be a, a glazed brick, uh, so that that uh, that uh, that uh, will still telegraph the original design intent of the building, uh, without uh, adding security issues uh, to um, to the uh, material inside. Expansion joints will be reintroduced at all these vertical locations. Uh, the infill that currently exists uh, didn't have expansion joints and caused some incidental cracking along the way, uh, which caused part of the degradation that we're here to, uh, to rectify at the moment. This is a close-up of the uh, louver detail. Uh, this is still to remain open uh, to the weather uh, to the extent that it will be uh, uh, not a closed horizontal extension for DOB purposes. Uh, it will be ventilated and open. It will prevent the uh, 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 raccoons and other animals from visiting and causing a destruction, which we've been having issues with recently. These are the elevations of the building. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, west elevation shows the louvered area to the right, and the east elevation shows the louvered area to the left. And there'll be a new uh, freight entrance uh, built into that covered yard uh, condition. Uh, the window uh, uh, slots uh, will be opened uh, and they will be replaced with, as I said, glazed block uh, with louvers at the top to match the glazing color to allow ventilation uh, into the facility. Uh, this is a view from the uh, east side. This is the working yard. Uh, as you can see here, the, all of this, uh, the trash compactor is in, and the fencing and so on will be cleaned up to allow for trucks to come in and actually deliver uh, uh, much needed uh, resources and materials to this facility, which services all of Queens uh, Park's uh, 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 properties. Uh, the block itself will be cleaned up and we still have not been able to determine precise color of the original building, but we are still in the research phase with that color. It will be an off-white to match the historic photographs. Uh, we're just trying to find something a little more specific along the way. This is the timber rail fence, which exists south of the building currently, and it will be extended north uh, under the Van Wyck Expressway to delineate the difference between the, uh, the parking lots there and the, um, and the, and the, the working uh, yard. Uh, this is the field block at the moment that we're assuming uh, for, the, um, uh, for the, um, uh, the block around the building. And these are the accent colors, this, uh, this blue louver and this blue glazed block to sort of indicate the, the original location of the vertical windows. Uh, there will be the louver, which will allow 33% open, so it will prevent most uh, animals from getting in, but it will still be an open condition. 
And these are the colors that we uh, have chosen from our standard palette to uh, match as closely to the, um, the palette in the World's Fair documents. Um, canopies will be recreated to recreate the original canopies uh, and indicate uh, that it is a parks uh, building at this point. Um, and the doors uh, will be uh, painted uh, weathered zinc uh, and uh, safety bollards around the entrance to the facility will be uh, timber uh, at this point. And there will be a new rolled out security gate to replace the one that's currently exists at the, at the, um, at the uh, ship break entrance. So that's the uh, presentation. I'll roll this back a little bit to this photograph and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is the first I heard um, that this is in the FEMA flood zone. I was wondering if you could go back to that map. I had some questions about that. Maybe this is more a, a Signy will need to uh, help us out here, but um, you had shown that early on. I didn't realize that's probably why a lot of the damage has occurred. So uh, what are you doing to uh, respond to the flood hazard for this? Because it's a big investment, $15.5 million into this structure. Uh, as far as we uh, have records, we uh, the facility has not flooded due to uh, storm flooding. Uh, it has incidental flooding in the um, in the um, in the in the uh, working yard uh, due to poor drainage. Um, most of the uh, mechanical, if not all of the mechanical, is already elevated. But the mechanical that we are replacing, obviously, we will be elevating uh, high within the facility. There are mezzanines in the facility that have been installed. Um, and it's just essentially a big box. So it will be uh, wet proof in the sense that it will be allowed to flood uh, and then it will be uh, cleaned up afterwards. Yeah, um, so I've done quite a lot of work in Flushing Meadows Park and there is kind of an underlying problem uh, with the fact that the site is, you know, formerly landfill and um, so you pointed out that there's some cracking in the slab that is translating up into the roof. I mean, is there is there a longer, is there another way to kind of deal with this sort of continual settlement and uh, that we are likely to experience? The building is built on deep piles. So the building is not settled at all. Um, the slab that we describe as being cracked is not a structural slab, it's a slab on grade. Uh, that slab, uh, you could remove that slab, it wouldn't impact the building structure uh, at all. Um, there's only one question mark, there's a DEP structure in the area that DEP is now investigating and trying to give us information on. But aside from that, the building is uh, holding up pretty well. Some of the cracking that we've uh, discovered in the block seem to have been from when the windows were replaced by CMU and it wasn't properly allowed to move in its original design. And so uh, forces were being translated into the block uh, across the length of that wall. And some of the cracking uh, we're uh, investigating, uh, we're discovering comes from that issue. So we'll be doing, uh, reintroducing um, expansion joints to allow the building to move in its original intent so that it won't uh, translate loads into those, into those blocks. And we will be replacing a lot of block that have been damaged over the years due to that infill. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I do think that there are some um, commissioner comments with regard to color. So if anyone would like to speak to that. Yes, I can. Um, so you submitted the color palette. Um, and just so I, I think it's not in this presentation, but we did see it. There's this whole color palette that you all have that's kind of stuff that's available to you on the shelf that relates to the world's fair colors. Um, and what you're proposing, if I understand it, is to try to get near that light fixture in color. Is that the light fixtures across the uh, across the fair were all different color configurations. This is the palette that Hamill and Langer had presented as part of the original design, and all of the fixtures participated in this palette. Mm -hmm. So originally, we had tried to match the color uh, uh, the color um, pattern the color palette of the light fixture closest to the entry. Uh, but that one, we did, just didn't have the right colors for it. So what we've done is gone back to the Hamill and Langer uh, 
palette of colors in front of us. And we've selected uh, colors from there. And we've basically worked with our palette of colors to try to say these colors match the original Hemel Langer color palette. And so we would propose this as an approach to the lumer, the allowable color, mm -hmm. and a memory of the, uh, the fixtures. I mean, I guess it to me, not to be Debbie Downer here, but um, it seems a little arbitrary and also maybe, in fact, confusing to the public to have bright colors on this part of this storage building that you think maybe I should be going there because there's something there. I would suggest using a more subdued color for this uh, grate, this uh, fencing that would be you know, something that goes obviously with the cobalt blue and a gray or something, pick one of those colors because it, it I mean, to me, it just doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. These colors were never on the building per se. So to just kind of put them on there now, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I would not support that. Okay, I mean, I, I think we're, we're very flexible with the colors. Uh, we went back and forth in many different approaches. Uh, I think we would agree uh, to, to pick up some of the cobalt and some of the, uh, the other colors uh, that we can tone it down, so that's not, that's not I mean, I, I think that it probably was a very handsome building and being the post office on those control joints that you now are gonna be able to use with the blue was, and that you, I think was pointed out by one of the other commissioners in our earlier discussion that it can align with the overhang opening void is, is a nice, um, you know, detail. And then maybe you bring that color across or some other color, a darker gray or something. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, the, um, saturated hues that definitely impact the the way that people sort of access or see the building. They might want to come up to it and think that it's publicly accessible. Um, I think that the you know perhaps because those larger um, blue bars are part of the vocabulary of the colors, maybe that there could be some sort of cool in colors that sort of respond to it on the brick um, or on the wall that may work better in terms of the overall palette. Um, yeah, because the yellow, the orange and green, I feel it's, it just, it, it is asking for people to come and come to the building and say, and try to figure out what that is. And, um, and it also may just be an opportunity for people to want to write on the wall because it's so bright and you would want to write on, on it too, as a contrast. So, yeah. I had a question about the signage. Um, it looks like the typeface on the right is meant to harken back to, you know, the, the, world's, the world's Fair kind of typography <laughs> signage, um, which, you know, I appreciate the kind of desire to, you know, kind of uncover the hidden history of the building. But um, I wonder whether it'd make more sense to actually use the contemporary house, you know, font and brand, just to kind of make clear that it is part of, you know, the current park system. Because similar to the colors, I, I think like the, you know, in and of itself, I think it looks very nice, but, um, you know, it, it's a little bit confusing whether this is part of like, you know, the park system because it doesn't have an official stamp on it. I think that's fair. I think we went back and forth with the with the, the signage, uh, whether it should be included or not. And um, most people were unaware of the history of the building. So we wanted to make a gesture to bring the, the building somewhat back, but still keep it as a back of house facility. So yeah, I think we will uh, take your recommendation and uh, look to uh, using the, uh, the standard parks font today. I think that makes a lot of sense to us. I mean, I, I do like the idea of surfacing the history of the of the building you know it'd be great to see that maybe it's like a plaque or something like that too because you know i think it's it's interpretation right right okay thank you um, are there any other commissioners who'd like to make a comment i think this has been um, very comprehensive. Jorge, we really appreciate the thought that your agency has put into the, you know, the challenges of the site, um, uh, as well as the, the history of the building itself. 
Um, so I would say that just summarizing the comments that I heard um, to restudy the, the colors of the, you call it the storage um, yard, as well as the uh, typography um, on the sort of branding of the building, but, but perhaps uh, uh, providing some acknowledgement of, of what the history, uh, the, what the building was in, in its first iteration. Um, so uh, is there any um, public uh, testimony? Oh, uh, Ken Seth, I see Ken Seth. I just, oh. I just want to ask one question because it wasn't covered in the, in the proposal, whether or not there was any discussion about uh, green roofing for this project. It's a, um, a, in the proposal itself, you can see lots of areas where water was collecting on the roof. There were flat areas of the roof and I wondered if there was the possibility to include some green roofing for so, at least some section of the building. The, the roof itself is a, a, a light. This is basically a, a first iteration of a big box store, as it were, back in the day. So the walls are just infill CMU wall. It's a, it's, a, it's a light steel frame that has light bar joists at the, at the roof. The roof is not really uh, designed to carry the load of, uh, of saturated um, uh, soils and green roof. Uh, the intent is uh, to uh, basically pitch the roof uh, back to its original design location, uh, design drainage locations and reattach those drains so that the water will not pond. It sh the water sh should never have ponded. It, the result of uh, the long and tried uh, history of uh, messing with the drainage on the roof has essentially created these ponding situations where there have been failures due to the load and to the water infiltration. So at the moment, no, we're not considering a green roof situation. It's an enormous roof. There's a lot of load to consider and we're not doing significant structural work to the building uh, other than sort of um, um, just re-establishing a, a proper drainage. <clears throat> Any other commissioner comments? I can now see you all on my. Uh, any public, uh, anyone signed up for public testimony, Carrie? No. Alrighty then. Uh, so we will now take a uh, roll call vote on item 27631. Uh, same drill, call your name, uh, state your preference. Uh, Phil. Approved. Ken said. Approved. Lori. Approved with the comments. Deborah. Approved. Manuel. Approved. Uh, Richard. Approved. Susan. Approved. Ethel. Approved. Meryl. Approved. Mary. Approved with comments. And uh, myself, uh, approved. Uh, so uh, let the record show that we have unanimous approval and this project is approved uh, with the um, comments that will be summarized by, by staff. Um, so we're moving on to the last item today, uh, 27632, a reconstruction of soccer fields at the Red Hook Recreation Area in Brooklyn. All parks all the time today. <laughs> so John, I'm gonna give you control. So it's <clears throat> I assume I have it. Is it working? Yeah, it says it's waiting for you to control the screen. You can test it by clicking on your mouse or on the arrow keys, moving your cursor. Is that that's not working? Not yet. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. You want to try advancing a slide? That's exactly what I'm trying to do right now. Okay. It does It does say that you're controlled. There we go. There we go. Okay, well, good morning. And um, project I'm presenting today is the fourth and final phase of the reconstruction and remediation of the Red Hook Recreation Area. Uh, it consists of two sites, uh, field number one, which is directly uh, in front of us, and field six, which is to the north across Bay Street, which is to the upper left-hand corner. It is a total of 7.3 acres, uh, five acres for field one, 2.3 for field six, and a total project cost of about $24.7 million. 
the goals uh, meet the remediation requirements of both DPR and DEC, provide uh, recreational facilities that meet the community needs. We want to maintain a low maintenance design and use sustainable remedial and stormwater practices. And very site specific, we want to improve the Clinton Street right of way, park access, and the connectivity between uh, phase four and the previous uh, park, previous uh, park phases. Uh, timeline uh, phases one to three are all approved and phase one and two are in construction right now. Uh, it's located in Red Hook, uh, just west of the BQE. Uh, in terms of the history, uh, the uh, DPR uh, assumed control of the property in the 1930s. Uh, par park was designed in 1939 and constructed soon thereafter. Um, pretty much maintains the exact configuration uh, of the original design uh, as it does today. The synthetic turf field was added in 2002. Uh, existing land uses, uh, industrial to the north, south, east, and park to the west. Uh, it falls within a VAX uh, flood hazard zones and has a BFE of 10 and 11. It does not fall within an MS4 drainage area. There are a handful of uh, small parks and playgrounds within a five to 10 minute uh, walk and obviously the remainder of Red Hook Recreation Area. Uh, the existing conditions, uh, the sites are elevated above the sidewalks uh, around them with an open space at the center and a very strong perimeter of uh, mature trees, mostly oaks. Uh, there are three entrances at field six, which is the top one. Uh, all of them are not ADA accessible. Um, at field one, uh, there are corner entrances. Three of them are open and accessible and the lower left, which is the southwest corner at Clinton Street and Halleck Street uh, is closed and it sits about uh, three and a half to four feet below grade. Um, field one has a synthetic turf field. Uh, field six is a narrow natural turf field. So again, there is industrial properties to the north, south and east and pedestrian circulation consists of the perimeter sidewalks uh, around both sites and the internal oval and elliptical uh, pathways within each. Bay Street is a relatively wide, fairly active street that separates the two sites. Uh, tree removals, uh, we are maintaining 110 existing trees and there's a handful of, uh, of uh, both design and uh, condition-based removals. Um, aerial photo uh, on the left is of phases one to three. On the right is phase four. A view into uh, field one at Bay Street and a view down Bay Street looking, uh, looking east. Um, this is a very unique uh, event which happens here during the, the warmer months uh, and it is the food truck marketplace, uh, very significant uh, to this park. Uh, undeveloped Halleck Street property uh, on the left is the southern border of the property, and that's that uh, the same boundary on the right-hand photo. Uh, view looking to Clinton Street, uh, the mature trees and the lower grade, and on the right-hand side shows the unimproved Clinton Street uh, right away. Again, looking at the southwest corner of the site, uh, and the industrial properties behind. Again, that's, that corner is about three and a half to four feet below grade. And a view looking from within the park to the Southwest. Um, flagpole uh, and bleacher at field one. A view looking to the West on the North side of Bay Street, uh, field six to the right and the entrance into field six. Some of the temporary uh, erosion control measures um, at Bay Street and the former Creamer Street, uh, which is the northern boundary of the site. Again, that's the northern boundary, steel bar fence and, and uh, higher metal fence. And on the right is Court Street uh, sidewalk. The view within field six, there's an amenity strip with uh, just a few uh, remaining elm trees. Uh, this one in particular will be removed. Um, 
The one on the right is another one looking south, uh, which is in far better condition and will remain. Another elm tree on the left, which will remain and a view looking east at the center of the field. So we maintained the original historical geometry of the site, but we are totally reconstructing and enhancing the park with new amenities to improve both the passive and active recreation. Uh, these amenity, amenities include new synthetic turf, uh, sports field lighting, pedestrian lighting, uh, misting stations, drinking fountains, picnic areas, uh, fitness uh, areas. Um, the big move was Bay Street and responding to those food trucks uh, and a food truck marketplace. Uh, this occurs weekends throughout the spring and fall, and we felt it was very important to make a much stronger connection. And we opened up the Bay Street frontage created a, a much stronger connections, both from within the park to the sidewalk and the, and the food trucks and from the sidewalk up into the upper levels of the park. Um, created several different uh, uh, seating, dining and gathering opportunities. And we'll look at this a little, in a little more detail. Uh, grading basically remains the same with the exception of providing a crown on field six. The existing trees really dictate our grading. So this is the uh, Bay Street uh, streetscape. Um, much improved connectivity uh, to the street frontage and the food trucks. There is a centrally located ADA accessible entrance and a small plaza uh, with direct access up to the upper levels of the, of the park. Um, we provided seating and dining niches uh, carved out between the critical root zones along Bay Street. Um, these are very large existing oak trees in there. Uh, it was very delicate trying to, to fit them in without damaging those CRZs. Um, the niches, the picnic area niches and the plaza will have decorative pavement. We provided a number of different size picnic tables um, and a number of different benches and uh, low retaining walls, which also have seating in them. This is a view, uh, both plan and section, looking at the Clinton Street improvements. Um, we've raised the pathway and provided a new entrance uh, up at street level um, and provided right of way improvements, including street curb, sidewalk, uh, new street paving and uh, street trees. It did, this did require the removal of some existing trees. This is one of the improved entrances at field six. Uh, we've provided ADA accessible ramps, landings, handrails, and really formalized a, uh, a desire line with a diagonal path to the D area. And this is typical on both the east and west sides of uh, field six. This is a plan and section through the uh, new entrance uh, area along Bay Street at the, at the center of the site. And it includes a, a sidewalk um, plaza area, uh, slightly widened uh, at that area and a series of planted terraces which lead up to the upper levels of the park. It's about a three and a half foot uh, grade change. Uh, and it includes a ADA accessible uh, ramp uh, from both the east and west sides and small staircases at each, at each end. Typical with the earlier phases, we've, uh, we're providing a four foot steel picket fence, which is replacing the steel bar, flat bar uh, fence for remediation purposes. And this was an original DEC requirement. Um, and that will surround uh, both sites and enclose some of the trees where there will only be partial remediation. Um, up at uh, field one at the, at the bottom is a chain link fence, which will protect uh, uh, basically ball control uh, at the north and south sides. We have planted areas uh, in those areas, uh, opened up the area at the four entrances leading up to the field. So there's no fence there. Um, and we have chain link fencing eight foot height behind the goals. And again, this is to protect the planting that's there as well as the seating areas. 
There's a decorative fence that we've used in the last two phases. It existed in, in phase two, which is the image in the lower right corner, a decorative pier and pipe rail. And that is represented by these, uh, the, the pink line. Uh, so that's a, a low fence around planted areas. So the remediation required a 12 inch uh, cap and in areas where the trees, uh, we, we really couldn't uh, remove 12 inches and there's a significant amount of existing trees as I mentioned previously. So these are being enclosed with, uh, within the four foot steel bar fence, steel picket fence. Uh, and the remediation there is zero to six inches within the critical root zone. And we provide a demarcation layer and it's planted with uh, ground covers. In those areas where we don't want to enclose the trees, it's full remediation. And this includes the very large trees along Bay Street where we need to stabilize those trees structurally and remove a certain amount of soil at a time uh, and replace it immediately. Um, and that will enable us to keep those areas open. Mm -hmm. The adult fitness equipment uh, in the uh, adult fitness area at field six, uh, it's a very family oriented uh, uh, area of field six. So we provided something for uh, adults there as well. Some of the site furnishings uh, all used in previous phases with the exception of the lower right where we have a louver fence surrounding the, uh, the trash collection area at field one. Again, the furnishings, weathered wood, all used in previous phases. We are replacing all of the pedestrian lights within the park uh, and we have two 20 foot uh, storage containers at each field and the pavers are, uh, are, are used in some of the public areas, uh, the plaza areas and the entrances at field six. And these are the same pavers that's been used in uh, phases two and three. Providing sports field lighting, um, 70 foot poles, uh, the equivalent LED lighting, the equivalent of a 30 foot candle. And these are historic plans, the original planting plan uh, for both sites. And we use this as a guide uh, for our planting plans. And we've added about 120 new trees. Uh, shrub, shrubs are really uh, limited to the areas around field number one, which are protected by, by fencing. Um, and we have ground covers in the remediated areas. Lawn areas are at the Bay Street uh, picnic area and at uh, six, uh, field six picnic areas. Some of the trees, again, these are all, this is mostly material that we've used on some of the previous phases. Ground covers, perennials, grasses. And permeability, we actually uh, lost some permeability by adding a fairly significant amount of program. Uh, so it's been reduced from 82% to 74%. And that concludes the presentation. Um, thank you so much, John. Uh, Carrie, is anyone signed up to testify on this project? No, we're good to go. All right, uh, commissioners, any uh, comments, questions from yourselves? Uh, yes, Deborah. Unmute. Yes, um, I, I don't know this site. John, and I'm just wondering, you had spoke about Bay Street and I don't, um, it, it, Bay Street's a through street, but then um, I, could you just speak about that a little bit? Because I was curious about, it seems like you did a great deal to make that a kind of space of social infrastructure because of the food trucks, but because there wasn't a section through, I was just wondering if um, like, how that will work because it seems like at certain times, if there are games going on, that in some ways that will become the site so I just, I, I didn't really understand that. And I just wonder if you could speak to that for a moment. Sure, well, it is a, it is a fairly active, uh, active street. And uh, 
who is controlling, you want to go back to, well, we can leave it here. Go back to the main street. Is that this one? I think one more. Okay, hold on. Or uh, other direction. That's here. Right, so um, the, the field level is elevated about three to three and a half feet above the sidewalk elevation. And right now there are 10 to 12 car um, food trucks that park along Bay Street, uh, all along that edge. I had, sh had shown a, a photograph of it earlier. So there is a very narrow um, sidewalk there, which needs to accommodate many, many people during the, the weekend in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, there's really not much porosity between the sidewalk and the, and the park site. Um, there are, uh, I think, maybe two entrances, small entrances that open up into the lawn areas and a handful of uh, picnic tables. So we wanted to make sure that this was very open and strongly connected to that sidewalk. And we provided a number of different gathering spaces along uh, Bay Street. Uh, again, we, we had to uh, really carve out these spaces relative to the existing large oak trees, which had a very significant the critical root zone. So we had to stay uh, as far away as possible to those, but still provide uh, a good amount of seating opportunities uh, uh, for the users of the food trucks. So just so I'm understanding properly, so basically Bay Street through traffic will keep going. Uh, and what you've done is you've kind of like pressed back the occupiable spaces on both sides to, to um, add gathering space, I guess. Right, so there, there is a, right now there's a, a, a grade rise from the sidewalk up to the field level, as I said, about, about three, three and a half feet. So we carved these uh, gathering spaces in. And if you uh, remember the, the image of the food trucks, they really line the entire curb line along the south side of, of Bay Street there. And okay, the thank you. First between the trucks and the and the park. Thank you. I, I understand better now and, and um, appreciate that you made the effort to add that space, which I imagine becomes a kind of locus for gathering uh, when there are games. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I just want to say I spent I spent a lot of time there <laughs> at this place at soccer games. And I really I can't wait until this happens. It's very it's a very well used area, both on the weekend, the food trucks. I mean, during the week, it's the soccer games like crazy. On the weekend, you got the food trucks and the food trucks are fantastic. The food is, I mean, we've driven over there from lower Manhattan because the food's so good. The, Me the Mexican food is so good there, guys. So anyway, I appreciate your response to that space. And there isn't really a lot of traffic. It's mostly everybody trying to get to the food trucks. So, um, <laughs> and then the seating and everything for those people watching those soccer games is really appreciated in the lighting. It seems it's a great project. So thank you so much. And thanks to the Parks Department for focusing on it. Um, any other comments? All right, well, I just wanna second Lori's enthusiasm for this uh, project. I think it's very thoughtful uh, and uh, very appropriate for um, the activities that uh, are and will be uh, on the site. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, we will now um, take a roll call vote on this project. It's <laughs> item 27632. Uh, so again, commissioners, when I call your name, please state your um, vote to approve, reject, table, uh, or abstain. Um, Phil? Approve. Ken Seth? Approve. Lori? Approve. Deborah? Approve. Manuel? Approve. Richard? Approve. Susan? Approve. Uh, Ethel? Approve. Meryl? Approved. Mary? Approve. And myself, approve. So again, we have another unanimous uh, approval in favor of uh, the project. And with that, I am adjourning the public meeting. Thank you all so much. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Thank you. Thank you.